Hi, everybody. My name is Gretchen Curtis. I'm a co-founder and CMO of Piston Cloud Computing. Um, this is the media and analyst panel. Uh, this is my sixth or maybe seventh summit at this point. Uh, a lot of these people up on stage have done this panel and have been in the OpenStack community for many years. So um, hopefully we'll learn a lot. Um, so why don't you guys just go down the line and introduce yourselves. Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren Nelson. I'm an analyst at Forrester Research. Um, this is my fifth summit. Uh, I write on private cloud and hosted private cloud environments. Um, and I've done a few reports recently on OpenStack. Um, and we see an increasing number of enterprise questions on, on OpenStack. I'm Al Sadowski. I'm a research director at uh, 451 Research. Uh, the channel I cover is mainly the service providers, so uh, my interest in OpenStack is obviously how the different service providers are involved. Uh, we track a lot of the uh, market sizing. We do a lot of, a lot of insight on OpenStack. I've been involved for a number of years now. Uh, I'm Stephen O'Grady. I'm the co-founder of Redmonk. Uh, Redmonk is a developer-focused industry analyst firm, so not surprisingly, my interest is on more on the developer side of the equation um, in terms of uh, how OpenStack is developed, how it's adopted by developers within organizations, how it competes with other developer-focused initiatives, and so on. I'm uh, Sean Michael Kerner. I'm a senior editor at eWeek and Internet News. I write about Linux, open source, and uh, OpenStack. And thanks to Gretchen, I've been on a panel like this uh, three times now. So we'll see if we'll see how much excitement we can generate this time around. <laughs> Great. All right. So I have a few questions prepared, and we'll probably go through those and. And then around uh, 11.30, 11.45 or so, we will open the uh, panel up to uh, questions from the audience. Okay, so my first question. The topic of a benevolent dictator versus a technical meritocracy has been a hot topic since the beginning of the OpenStack project. And in fact, it came up again this morning in Troy Toman's talk. So many people have voiced concern that OpenStack is lacking a benevolent dictator. Is this concern valid? And if the process is working and getting better over time, why do some people still think OpenStack can't make it without its own Linus Torvalds? I, th I, think, uh, I think this is a question that keeps coming up again and again, because in the media, most people don't understand how Linux actually works, uh, which is the bottom line. Uh, Mr. Torvalds is the uh, not even the maintainer of Linux, necessarily, at this time. He issues the releases. He's very vocal on mailing lists, but it's not like it's a go or no-go decision on something coming in. If it passes through the code, it's fine. But, but he's, uh, th there's the cult of the, of the founder uh, in the technology world, and that's why it occurs. I think in OpenStack, we have Jonathan Bryce is at the top level. At the release level, there's, there's Theory, who does the same role as Torvalds, essentially. So uh, clinically speaking, uh, we do have a benevolent dictator that pushes things through at the same level. Well, I, I would also say that I think you know, frankly, from an open source perspective, one of the things you see over and over is uh, a desire to replicate, you know, models that we've seen previously. Um, and, you know, Sean said the, uh, the idea that, you know, Linux is a benevolent dictatorship is a little bit questionable um, on substance, but that's the assumption, you know, and it's, we've seen this for years, you know, that the GPL was the most popular license, you know, by an order of magnitude for years, and you'd go out and talk to developers, and say, why is this? You know, hey, did you choose this license on its merits? And they'd say, more often than not, well, it's the one that Linux and MySQL use. So I'm, I'm assuming it's the right one, um, you know, as opposed to putting a lot of thought into it. So it's not terribly surprising that you know people look at, hey, this is a different model. Uh, there are questions about this. Uh, so let's go with something that you know we think has worked before. Uh, you know, the new is always scarier than the old. Um. Actually, uh, to, to take a, a little different uh, uh, slant, so I think the question that ultimately is being asked is, can the community-driven uh, model work? And the way the foundation is set up with technical leads and PTLs and having uh, uh, elections every release prevents somebody from you know, hijacking the, uh, the, um, the uh, agenda. But what probably needs to be thought about is, you know, as more companies make more money within OpenStack, they obviously have um, interests beyond possibly just what the community wants. So, you know, just as long as the model continues where, you know, PTLs and technical community and the board continues like that, it, you know, potentially has the ability to su succeed uh, without having that one, you know, person on the top. But still, you know, remains to be seen if a business that, you know, doesn't agree with do we need to 
add features or do we need to add stability, um, potentially goes off and you know, does their own thing. But there is a, a uh, foundation in place to, to prevent something like that from happening. Yep, and I'd echo those thoughts um, in terms of uh, the foundation today. There's a lot of assurances in place to essentially uh, avoid having one voice carry out across the entire community. Um, but uh, in the same light, a lot of the actual contributions itself are very much uh, slanted on, on essentially uh, some voices are heard more strongly than others. And you definitely get more slants. There's definitely advantages of doing more uh, focuses on essentially uh, hardening of resources versus creating net new projects. So I think there's a, a good mix today. I don't necessarily think that it's a, a lacking of by seeing a benevolent leader versus a meritocracy, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think that it's just a different model. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so this next question is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so we keep seeing stories, blog posts, and reports bemoaning the lack of large-scale production deployments of OpenStack. Yet the rumor mill and insider gossip tell us that several vendors <clears throat> have a growing number of large deployments either running in production or headed that way, um, and this I can confirm to be true. Um, unfortunately, many of these customers have us vendors under strict NDA. Is this reluctance to talk about large-scale deployments of OpenStack hurting the community? Why are customers so reticent to disclose the details, and how can we break the cone of silence? <laughs> Well, the thing you hear today about, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear me on this, but the top question at the last few summits have been, is OpenStack Enterprise ready? There's even a session on it right now. <laughs> um, it, but it's kind of this, this question of, are you going to be able to run your full production size workloads in an OpenStack environment? Um, and this, if we're not talking about how this is already being done today, is it hurting the community with folks not believing in the, the initiative itself? Uh, even uh, last week, we had a talk with Forrester on uh, our developer mind share versus those focusing more on the infrastructure as a service side on how prominent OpenStack really is. Um, and there's this kind of debate about essentially how pervasive it's going to be, whether it's going to actually extend past just a test dev environment, where it's a fun thing for developers to play around with with for a specific application or specific set of resources, but will never carry across over your, uh, essentially, that, that systems of record, um, rather than just being a place for those new systems of engagement resources. Um, in a way, it, w it would benefit the, the movement by having more case studies, more examples, um, but I think there already are quite a few. Um, there's a number of very large enterprises that have told this story. There's also some public ones that have used vendors to get to this, this position. I think what's more lacking in the market and, and hurting the community more is just this kind of lack of information and kind of this uh, need of, well, if OpenStack is going to be enterprise ready, it needs to be a direct distribution that you're using of OpenStack and not through a vendor that essentially makes it more consumable. Um, right now, the biggest thing we hear when we're talking about customers is uh, they want to go OpenStack, but there's a lack of knowledge on what that will take, essentially how much engineering power they're going to have to put behind that in order to get an enterprise-ready deployment up and going uh, without having uh, vendor expertise or a partner that has gone that journey already. Uh, so that's the number one thing I think that is essentially holding back in terms of larger, large-scale enterprise adoption. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's the lack of those coming forward and telling their story. It's more the details behind that. Um, so the short answer to the question is yes, there needs to be more examples. Um, when people are drawn to OpenStack, what they've told us is that the community, you know, the number of vendors involved and the big names involved and people putting money behind it, that's kind of what has drawn them to and int created the interest. But they need to see more examples in the wild. You know, there's tons of POCs going on. A lot of people kicking the tires and doing things like test and dev. But to to have more at scale production examples from 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 uh, the enterprise community, everybody knows about PayPal and Mercado Libre and Cisco WebEx and the, the classic examples uh, Comcast presented in Portland. And there's a number of Asian companies in. Uh, at the Hong Kong summit that presented in, at, at scale. But the more that can be done with that, where peers can see their, their um, you know, competition, uh, you know, Fidelity uh, decides to use OpenStack, Wells Fargo is using OpenStack. So to see more of that will, will make things easier. Making it easier to consume will obviously make it a lot better as well. Well, and as to the portion of the question that sort of 
got to why this happens, I think the answer to me is pretty simple. You know, you talk to businesses, and most of the businesses that we speak with who are using OpenStack and other technologies uh, somehow assume that not talking about this is some huge competitive advantage for them. You know, as if by not telling somebody what you're doing, you're stealing some leg up in spite of the fact that this is a publicly available technology. And the irony of, of that sort of, that, that fact is that all these companies end up talking to us, the analysts, and then we end up selling them back that information because they didn't want to talk about it publicly in the first place. So it ends up being this uh, very ironic situation. As to the impact for OpenStack, it certainly has an impact. You know, customer, the more that you can talk about public use cases, the more comfortable customers are. That being said, you know, from my standpoint, the impact is relatively marginal. Um, you have you know, sort of a level of commitment uh, across the board from startups you know, to very, very large incumbents, you know, people who are spinning up very, very large investments on the technology, which tends to give you know, enterprise buyers a fair degree of confidence. So is there an impact? Sure. Is it a huge impact? Probably not. Uh, from my perspective, just dipping into the historical time banks, the first time I saw Werner Vogels was probably 2003 at a Linux World event in San Francisco. And same time, this is 11 years ago now, people were asking the same exact questions about Amazon. Uh, but Werner uh, is an interesting guy. He, he just doesn't care, right? So uh, with Amazon, I think it was a three to five year time frame. I think once uh, Netflix flipped it over, what, 2008, give or take, so we'll call it five years, other people started to jump on. And I know numbers aren't public for Amazon uh, in terms of their financial contributions, but I think it was a three to five year time frame. When we're talking OpenStack, we're talking now, what, we're three and a half years out from its creation. These are still baby steps. I think the sweet spot is three to five years. So for me, it's just a functional question of time. Large organizations take time to disclose. If we look from the example of Amazon, I think OpenStack is accelerating quicker than Amazon, thanks to the Amazon example. Okay. One of you remarked that at every OpenStack summit, you see more and more vendors. And if any of you have been down to the marketplace, I think you'll notice it looks like a real show now. Um, in your opinion, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And is there such thing as too many vendors? Well, I was talking to a colleague this morning and, and we, we uh, agreed that the perfect number is probably 42 vendors. <laughs> um, <laughs> Always 42. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah, the yeah. ultimate <laughs> question, the answer was 42. So we decided 42 <gasps> is the right amount. Um, but I think ultimately the market will decide. Um, which is, you know, quite simply, uh, you know, remains to be seen. Yeah, to me, I, I would actually say that it's, it's more vendors is more better, honestly. Um, you know, if you look at sort of historical strength of platform, you know, a lot of that strength has less to do with the actual quality of the underlying technology, more to do with the size of the ecosystem that's built on top of it uh, and around it. So it's not to say that sort of more vendors is a, sort of unmitigated good in the sense that it becomes more difficult to navigate. It does pose challenges. But the larger the ecosystem, historically speaking, you know, the better off the underlying platform has been. Uh, again, just because I think from a historical perspective, and you know open source licensing better than I do, Stephen, but uh, in the, there was a period of time about 10 years ago where there was a vast proliferation of open source licenses. Every company and their brother made their own open source license, which was basically a derivative of Apache with attribution or this, that, or non-attribution, et cetera. There was also a wide explosion of uh, Linux distributions. There still are. What tends to happen, though, is uh, you know the cream rises to the top, etc. And there'll be a lot of secondary, tertiary vendors, and there'll be a core of three vendors, just like there's a core of three licenses and a core of three to five uh, Linux distributions, and that'll be it. The other ones will be on the periphery, just like there's the periphery of open source licenses and the periphery of Linux distributions. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing. As you mentioned, the market will filter out those that, that aren't successful at meeting a need within OpenStack. Um, I think the bigger question is making sure that that core is strong and that those that carry the OpenStack label meet a certain certification level. Um, as I mentioned in the keynote today, that is going to be a key component of moving forward. Um, if everybody's using OpenStack to, you know, to a certain level and it's very different, it's going to be very difficult to get to that next stage of having some level of interoperability. So now if you carry that OpenStack label, you need to be able to uh, write to have certain API connectivity to other uh, other resources that are within that open stack community. Um, a lot of folks are struggling today in terms of the interoperability question and whether the fact that we have such a huge ecosystem, but 
no two are interoperable. Um, and uh, as this label gets more developed, it's going to be a much more connected world where you're going to see that next iteration where it will be a more open, open space. Uh, but I, I don't think the number of vendors is going to influence whether that's successful or not. What are the top pet peeves of media and analysts? Uh, what are the top pet peeves you have when talking to vendors and users of OpenStack? What do you wish we'd stop saying, and what do you wish you heard more of? Uh, Be nice. <laughs> uh, honestly, I think uh, you know, that, and I'm sure that uh, uh, vendors have their own list of pet peeves in terms of their conversation with analysts. But uh, for me, the, the, one of the sort of stupidest and most superficial ones is. You know, everybody wants to come out and say, I'm the market leading this, and you know, I'm the best in the world at that. You know, where from our perspective, let the market tell us that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I would much prefer a vendor show up and tell us what you can and can't, you know, what you believe you can and can't do. Uh, you know, give us use cases and so on. But as far as the you know, world beating and fastest and big, you know, it's just, you know, let the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like saying, I'm funny. Well, you can't really claim that. You let other people say that about you. And I think from a vendor standpoint, I think it's very much the same. My perspective, yeah, same, same thing. Like in my inbox this morning, I had, uh, I think, 21 pitches from PR people saying that they were the first or only in the OpenStack marketplace, and it was it made it seem like it was just them, so that's kind of funny. But my biggest pet peeve when I talk with uh, vendors is, uh, in many cases, not in the case of Piston, of course, but a, a true lack of understanding of, of how uh, OpenStack works. You know, that there's the various layers and that how there's an upstream and that there's open core and open source. So I, I think there are uh, some core vendors, I hate using the word core, but there's some core vendors in OpenStack that are core Linux vendors that understand, but then there's a lot uh, of secondary and tertiary vendors who have no clue how open source model works, no clue about licensing, and they think just because they're API compatible means that they're actually contributing upstream. So that understanding between upstream and, and this whole marketplace is a definition that um, certain marketing organizations probably need to learn better. Sure. Um, my big ones on the first or only in one category or another where they've created this very niche market on them being the first and only. Um, the other big frustration is just when they talk about interoperability as being a key down point of OpenStack, as I mentioned before, as it being whether the actual project itself will be successful. Um, and I, I think that comes from a lack of education on where the initiative, the progress it's come from, and, and where it's going. And those are probably my biggest pet peeves. So uh, a couple things. One, everybody should stop using the word ecosystem because it's like way, way overused and it's pretty much meaningless at this point. Um, the second one is using hybrid cloud um, incorrectly and everybody markets something with hybrid cloud. I think last year at the summit, everybody used software defined networking. Like that was the big, you know, every piece of collateral in Portland had SDN on it, and I think I would venture to guess that everybody's collateral this time has hybrid cloud on it, or pretty close. We actually uh, had a briefing once, and a vendor suggested that co-location and shadow IT for two completely random separate business functions was shadow was uh, hybrid cloud, and that is not hybrid cloud. But it's yeah, we did a lot of work around this, got input from a lot of vendors, including Piston Cloud and. Internaps in the audience, a number of people, um, and came. It starts with the NIST definition, but it didn't go far enough. But it's to deliver business processes seamlessly. It's not just because you have two things. Um, and then finally, the other thing I'd mention is that uh, vendors, when they talk about what they have, don't talk about what the product is in the, in the features, but what business problems is it going to solve? It's you got a distro or you got a turnkey OpenStack product, okay, but a lot of other people do, but what business problems are you trying to solve with that? So I think hybrid cloud opens a big can of worms on, on what that is, because uh, essentially cloud plus anything else. So essentially if you have some sort of SaaS usage and then you use on-premise applications, that is a hybrid cloud of sorts, whether they're, they interact, whether they're connected. Uh, I would push to say that I would say that hybrid cloud is a pet peeve and that it doesn't describe anything. Um, because there are so many different definitions on where folks draw the lines on hybrid and not hybrid today. Um, some folks, when they're talking about hybrid cloud, it's uh, fully connected to environments where you can essentially do uh, load balancing between these environments and bursting from one environment to another. Others look at it as unified management. Others look at it as two isolated environments that aren't connected, but they have the, pu the presence of public and private. Uh, it just is such a 
nebulous term that doesn't really quantify to anything yet today. Um, so that I'd say that that is a pet peeve in myself, just that it is so nebulous and varies so much today. Yeah, I completely agree. And most of my confusion is because uh, of VMware's vCloud hybrid service, which is kind of sort of both and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So this is probably our final question before we open it up to the floor. This is a two-part question. So I'd like each panelist to answer individually, and it's okay if there's repetition and overlap. So question one, what is the top reason enterprise customers are drawn to OpenStack? And the second question, what is the main thing preventing greater adoption? Both together or one at a time? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, first, first reason is momentum. Everybody wants to be on the bandwagon. That's easy. Uh, the greatest barrier is a lack of understanding of how it fits in with existing proper enterprise IT systems. Some people are just using it as an overlay, but there is uh, more legacy than there is cloud, and that transition is something that is uh, a challenge for anybody, whether it's OpenStack or otherwise. Yeah, I, I would say my answer to the first, I think, would be, you know, really the open source nature of the platform in the sense that, you know, a lot of... A lot of vendors who originally said they weren't going to get locked into an operating system got locked into an operating system. The same customers that said they weren't going to get locked into a virtualization layer got locked into a virtualization layer. And you know, once you get to the to the you know, cloud platform layer, you know, they would like to, in many cases, make different choices. You know, so that to me, I think, is one of the you know when we have these conversations, that's one of the big uh, the big factors. You know, that combined with the availability. Um, as far as sort of the biggest, oh, I don't know. You know, the big what was it the Exact Main wording. thing preventing greater adoption. Preventing greater adoption. Um, honestly, to me, it's the it's questions around compatibility. Um, it you know came up in the keynotes this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's come up, I think, every time I sat on this panel. You know, the question of what is OpenStack, right? You know, which pieces do you have to implement? Which pieces can be substituted out? What version compatibility uh, do I need to have? You know, to be using the OpenStack label. You know, that's one of the primary concerns that we hear from. You know, folks looking to invest in this over the longer term because if OpenStack ceases to mean OpenStack and ceases to mean one thing and you don't have that compatibility, then you're right back down the path of lock-in that I talked about in the first uh, part of the question. Um, as far as uh, the, the first part regarding momentum, uh, all the enterprises that we talk to, everybody is drawn to the OpenStack community based on other people being involved, or the, you know, the, the ecosystem, the snowball effect of, of people being involved. Um, clear, clearly, that is why they're drawn. They want to avoid vendor lock and the same things that you know, Sean and Stephen talked about. And as far as what's preventing them, I guess, so I, I see OpenStack kind of like old school oatmeal. And <laughs> bear with me for a second, but in the old days when you made oatmeal, you know, you take that big uh, cardboard mm -hmm. canister, you got to boil water, you put it in the pot. Mm -hmm. If you cook it too long, it burns. It's a, it's a mess. You got to add your own stuff to it. What OpenStack needs to get to is instant oatmeal. You rip open the bag, you throw in some water, it's ready to go. But doesn't the original taste better? The original does taste better, <laughs> but you know, it's a pain in the ass to clean up at the end. That's so true. <laughs> um, so it needs uh, to get like that, you know, orchestration, like automation, uh, deployment. It, it just needs to work a lot easier. Uh, people see how many developers it takes to go and build it on their own. And I think with Ice House, there's 20, uh, uh, 1,200 different parameters now that can be mm -hmm. configured. It yeah. just needs to be easier to consume. You know, mm -hmm. rip it open, throw in some boiling water, and it works. Uh, in terms of top reasons for adoption, um, they've hit on all the major ones, momentum, excitement within the development gr group of being involved in this large community and ecosystem. Sorry, you're using that word. Um, <laughs> and uh, essentially this uh, avoiding of vendor lock-in. Um, in terms of barriers, so in, it's how you look at OpenStack adoption. So in terms of enterprise adoption through a vendor partner, uh, there's a lot, uh, there's many, there's far fewer barriers to that. Uh, they make it a lot more consumable, ready right out of the box. Um, I'd say that the main barrier on that side is in terms of support and compatibility of different hypervisors. And a lot of those vendors have worked on that to improve that experience as well. Um, if you look at adopting OpenStack directly, uh, I think it's a use case. So when I look at the private cloud market, I see different types of private clouds. I see those are these pervasive transformational clouds that bridge across their systems of engagement and systems of record. Um, and I see the biggest challenge there is uh, OpenStack is slow to start up. 
and those initiatives are already very slow in, in moving. So essentially these environments take three to five years to start up using a vendor directly. Um, there are substantial efforts, they have to do policy process, uh, standardization, and optimization, um, and adding OpenStack to the mix makes it very difficult to be able to achieve the timelines they're looking for. Um, if it's a much more targeted OpenStack adoption, a much more targeted private cloud, uh, one that's more focused on systems of engagement, that's where we see the most and the most targeted usage of OpenStack today. Um, where we look at those that are using or trying to build an enhanced virtualization environment, where it's all about improvement of IT uh, virtual machine management, then that's when we start to see those where OpenStack is, is not a fit at all. They're looking for just improved uh, management tools where they can look how their resources are, are acting and looking how they can better load balance and consolidate resources throughout their environment. So I think uh, expansion across use cases, not necessarily to enhance virtual virtualization, but expansion to be more consumable to target that transformational cloud would increase its ability for to have greater adoption. Um, and until that time, vendors have, have made that a lot easier. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're going to open the uh, panelists up here for questions from the audience. So I believe there's a mic out there in the middle. So if you have a question, I think you can go up to the mic or... Hello, I'm Rainia Mosier. I am a development manager at Rackspace over in our public cloud shared services division. And um, I wasn't able to go to Hong Kong. Um, I was at San Diego and Portland prior to that. But this is actually the first summit where I have heard ecosystem being overused. So I, as much as you guys are like rolling your eyes at it, I would really like to hear more. In the development world, um, you, you know, the active technical contributors are actually coming and saying, hey, we don't. We don't want to ruin the ecosystem with all this corporation stuff and all this trying to make money and actually be profitable. Um, so if you could expand more on where you're seeing that overused and areas where it absolutely is kind of already been over overdone to death, I would I would appreciate it as a dev manager. Al. I'll start. First, I, I, like, <laughs> I like the front of your shirt. That's cool. I, I don't really know HTML, but I figured that one out. Yes. Um, this is part of our, our diversity initiative, one of our diversity initiatives at cool. Rackspace. So I, I was kind of saying it a little jokingly, but just in terms of marketing, it just seems to be a word that is just so overused. But it, as far as um, OpenStack is concerned, I think a lot of people can confuse it thinking OpenStack is a product. And it's not really a product. It's a, 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 a series of projects that come together to build whatever somebody's looking to build. and you know, whether that's an ecosystem or not. But I, I just was saying in terms of, just from a marketing standpoint, it's just a word that just everybody uses to describe everything nowadays. I think Amazon was the, the first vendor that really showed how powerful ecosystem could really be where their marketplace, their ecosystem, provides such additional capability um, and independent growth beyond what they work on uh, themselves that it all suddenly became a focus for a lot of vendors in this space, um, where ecosystem can essentially provide added value to their customers that they may not have realized otherwise. Um, and OpenStack, uh, I, I personally don't think ecosystem's overused. Where I kind of wonder the boundaries of that is, where essentially you're part of the ecosystem in that you support certain projects or support different APIs, uh, the boundaries of that. So are you providing additional functionality? What is that service that you add on that you can't get from the core system itself? Um, and, and what base level of compatibility do you need to have in order to fit within that ecosystem? Um, but I personally like that organizations are starting to focus more on this ecosystem rather than how much money they can throw at a certain initiative themselves and looking at this innovation that's outside of their own, own organization. Um, I'm actually going to introduce some tension into the panel. This is what you're supposed to shoot for as a moderator, right? Is people arguing with each other. Um, I don't agree that the term is overused, and I, I don't agree that Amazon was the first. Um, I actually like the term ecosystem. I think, you know, certainly in some cases it's a little, it's used a little vaguely and non-specifically, and that can be a problem. But I think in general, you know, the wider, you know, sort of the, the as I said before, the collection of projects, you know, both as distributions, but built in and around, um, you know, the platform itself, is indicative of success, and to me, it's not, I mean, Amazon certainly is a good example in the cloud world, but as far as I'm concerned, everybody here is still borrowing from Windows, right? All of the lessons in terms of how these platforms play out and the aggregate 
uh, value of the applications that get built in on top of around um, uh, the underlying platform. You know, to me, everything is you know falling from Windows where. That was a, it was very, very difficult to compete with Windows for years because you weren't just competing with Windows, you were competing with Windows and all of the applications that went along with it. So even as Linux became more and more technically capable and more and more competitive from a, a technology perspective, it was still difficult to compete because there'd always be, uh, you know, hey, that's great, but you don't run these five things that I need. You know, they're Windows only. So obviously we don't want an environment in which things are OpenStack only, or AWS only, or VMware only, or, or what have you. But by and large, um, the, the ecosystem lessons that you're seeing most of these platforms um, absorb have come from previous iterations of previous platforms. I don't like the word ecosystem because from an open source background, I like the words upstream and I like community because they have real meaning. So if we have an ecosystem partner that is not necessarily open source, and is not contributing upstream, are they still really part of the community? The answer is they may be part of the wider ecosystem, but from an active technical contributor perspective, community and upstream are two different things than ecosystem. And the technical contributor is absolutely right when they say, hey, that's infecting you know, business and commercial, because the ecosystem partners are not always contributing upstream. They're not always technically part of that open source community. So there's a, a definitional difference that people need to uh, think about when they're using the words. I'd like to ask, uh, it seems like there's many small camps, small groups of users developing and, and certainly to implement some of these deployments that I hear about in, in OpenStack and I'm kind of curious, um, does, does Red Hat's emergence to you help to kind of make this a little bit more of a plain vanilla for folks to kind of, more and more folks to really start to use and implement in a broader way? Um, kind of how do you think about to what degree is the initial adoption kind of fractured little camps and kind of what does it take do we need to have something that's more plain vanilla so that you get larger adoption? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know any plain vanilla, but as I said before, the most important thing to me is, and you know, again, it, was, it came up in the keynotes this morning, it's come up, well, hell, every five minutes in an OpenStack conversation that you have, uh, to me it comes back to defining what is core, right? Because basically, you're going to want to see different people implementing OpenStack. You know, they're going to want to have their differentiation. They're going to want to be different in some way, whether it's services they layer on top, whether it's services they layer on side. But you have to have that confidence to me, and this is maybe what you're getting at with the vanilla, which basically says, all right, this is OpenStack. This is the core of OpenStack. If you implement this, you can use the OpenStack trademark. You know, this is, you know, um, you, you should have some confidence that if vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C are running something that they call OpenStack, that you should have a core set of services and a core level of compatibility that is consistent from vendor to vendor to vendor. Um, and like I said, I, you know, Red Hat, you know, certainly will play a part in that, but all the vendors need to play a part in that in terms of defining, all right, here's the core. All right, everything else, that's fine. You know, there may be some variability. There may be things that, okay, don't necessarily work exactly the same. Uh, you know, from platform to platform. You know, you look at Java as a classic example here where, you know, Sun, you know, for vendors to have the, um, uh, to carry the Java uh, uh, trademark had to pass a TCK. You know, a very, very complicated set of test cases. And there were things that everybody, you know, WebLogic, WebSphere, everybody else built around it that were different and offered some differentiation from platform to platform. But you had, theoretically, you know, some level of compatibility from vendor A to vendor B to vendor C. And that's absolutely, in my opinion, you know, what we need to see for OpenStack over time. It's one of the reasons that we've been pushing for something like you know, sort of a, a closely defined core for a while. I, I think where we're going to see camps emerge is the Red Hat guys have their own worldview of how uh, orchestration works. That's why they were you know, talking this morning about cloud forms. Uh, if you're a Red Hat enterprise Linux guy, you're used to you know, RPM and those kinds of packaging. The Ubuntu's of the world use Juju and Charms and other things. Piston has has its own system, so I think it's going to be, there's there's going to be a couple core systems where people will gravitate based on uh, the tooling that they like. The definitions are all important, but as a user, it's the tools that you're used to. If you're used to using Red Hat, if you're used to RPM based building tools, uh, you're probably going to stick with Red Hat. If you're used to Ubuntu and you love Juju Charms, which are you know not a frosty cereal but a really interesting kind of magical treat. Uh, then you'll stick with uh, a canonical based distribution and then there's other people uh, that will filter around that. 
ultimately the uh, the foundation is the one that decides who has a distro. They have a you know definition. It needs Nova and it needs Swift and some other pieces before it'll bless it as a as a distro. I think there's eight or nine. The latest being you know HP Helion last week, and they're all a little different. Uh, Piston has a turnkey uh, software platform that has some secret sauce in it. It's not a hundred percent. OpenStack, Red Hat is, says, and Mirantis say that they're 100 percent, but they all, at the end of the day, you know, fulfill a need for for an end user, and it's you know they want a easier to consume, uh, supported version of OpenStack. So whether it's all vanilla, if that means 100 percent OpenStack or not, you know, I think every, there's a place for everybody. And again, going back to a question we answered earlier, the marketplace will decide you know which ones will uh, will still be still be around. Dan Pasek from Red Hat. Just had a, an observation, because I, I try to take a real holistic view to the whole space. Given what we've heard from um, IBM pushing KVM and on power, and KVM on Z, and now we have OpenStack on Solaris, how tightly coupled do you see going forward? And don't, don't forget ARM, right, and the ARM stuff. So how tightly coupled do you think OpenStack is going to remain to the x86 architecture? And how successful do you think the other architectures may or may not be going forward? Uh, my answer to that would be, I think a lot depends on, on uh, the hardware side as opposed to the software side. And what I mean by that is, is that um, ARM obviously is, is progressing towards you know, legit 64-bit chipsets you know, that consume a lot less power than x86 and you're sacrificing some performance. Um, you know, IBM touted at, uh, what was your show, a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, you know, Google's come out, they made their own uh, power, you know, motherboards and so on. So to me, you know, in other words, I think like virtually every other cloud, you know, computing effort, you know, both public, private, open source, proprietary, what have you, it's been all x86 all the time. Uh, but that's largely been a function of uh, the success and, you know, the, the performance characteristics and cost characteristics in the underlying hardware platforms. So in other words, to, to give you just an example, if ARM is successful at achieving you know, good 64-bit compatibility that can assume you know, reasonable workloads, I think you could expect to, you know, you could expect to see over time uh, OpenStack move to, to embrace that, right? Because as more people want to run uh, ARM in the data center, I, I can't see OpenStack saying, the hell with you guys, we're just going to run x86 forever, right? It's not realistic. But again, I don't think it's, you're not going to make those decisions in advance of widespread adoption um, and, more importantly, evolution from the hardware side of the equation. Uh, that has to happen first. Everything follows from there. I think uh, ARM in the data center is interesting, but uh, simple reality is Calzada, who is one of the most hyped and probably the most promising, in my opinion, ARM server vendors is now bankrupt. So it's uh, interesting to talk about, but the practical reality is probably somewhat uh, less interesting. I think that might be a function of time, though. I think they may have been too early. All right, unless anyone else has any final questions, going once, going twice. Okay, I think that, oh, one more. Final question. Come on down. What is the meaning of life? Hi, uh, Louis De Palma from William Blair. Can you talk about the third party hardware certification process and how that relates to OpenStack? There was something in the news, I think it was three weeks ago, about how Mirantis wanted to make the third party process open for the OpenStack community as a whole to certify, to certify third party vendors. And I think Red Hat and Rackspace were opposed to having the community as a whole certify because they wanted their individual distributions to certify select hardware. Can you discuss your thoughts on that and how you think that's going to evolve? Mm. I'll just give you my two cents. Uh, Mirantis has their driver log project, which uh, is announced this morning as part of OpenStack Marketplace drivers. So there's third-party compatibility for some things, and that's open. But you have to remember, at the, at the end of the day, OpenStack has to run on top of an operating system. That operating system is either Linux and now possibly Solaris. 
that operating system should be certified by the operating system vendor on a given hardware, the same as Linux has been certified by the last 10 years. There's no difference, in my opinion, between how Linux has been certified and how OpenStack on hardware should be certified, because it's still the same set of distributions. Um, William, it's, that's probably a question more for the foundation to answer. Uh, you know, I don't think as media and press were spokespeople for, for the foundation, but uh, what I would say, though, is that uh, projects that, like Troy referenced uh, this morning about uh, RefStack mm -hmm. and having the ability to, you know, have these, uh, these tests and uh, ability to do better certification on, uh, on whether it's an API or physical hardware, things like that will help, um, especially as people look to do federation and be able to use any kind of hardware uh, on, uh, with OpenStack. I, th I think things like that need to help and help need to uh, be there and, and will help the momentum even further. But you know, as far as how it works, that, that's not really something I can answer. Yep, yeah, and just how the labeling and with the certifications go along with that to avoid confusion in the market. Uh, I'd say that's the biggest, biggest component for those that play in multiple spaces, making sure the certification at each level is, cl is clear. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Cool. Thank you very much to our panelists and probably see you uh, next OpenStack Summit for another media and analyst panel. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.